Yeah, we are live. Excellent. Um, excellent. Welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, my name is Nicola O'Brien. I'm one of the team at the, AB, uh, the ACA. Uh, before we get underway, I just want to thank you all for coming along today, especially um, I know that teachers around the country were all got lots of difficult circumstances at the moment, whether it's the weather, uh, children being at home, there's a lot of really challenging situations. So we really appreciate everyone who's made the time to join us today. Uh, we're looking forward to stepping you through coding concepts. Um, before we get underway, I'll just let you know a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a member of the team with a focus on primary school education. So I work a lot with teachers to make sure that primary school teachers, particularly general teachers, feel confident and well equipped to cover the Australian curriculum in their classrooms and work on engaging activities for primary school students. Um, Bruce Feuder is presenting with us today. I'm going to let Bruce introduce himself and hand you across now and then we'll talk about what we're covering today. Hi everyone, my name is Bruce Feuder. Um, I've been at the ACA now for a few years and prior to that was working uh, in schools down here in Canberra. I've uh, uh, taught primary school year six right up to year 11 and 12 in high school and my background is as a computer scientist prior to teaching. My emphasis is clearly in the secondary space um, and I've been teaching programming to students now for about 15 years and was one of the writers of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. So bringing a lot of that uh, curriculum expertise as well to the discussion today. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Bruce, can I just confirm you're seeing my Google Slides there? I absolutely am. Not in presentation mode at the moment, but That's I can okay. see. Um, for everyone who's joining, and I've, I can see that more people are joining by the minute, so I'll just say again, we are recording today's session uh, and we are also broadcasting live on Facebook. So welcome in. For those who are joining us via Zoom, um, we'd like to use the annotation features today. Uh, these let you take part in the session with us and give us some information. So the annotation features you'll find at the top of your screen where it says that you're viewing my screen, you can click on view options, which opens a drop down, and then there's something called annotate that lets you decorate my screen. So just to see who that's working for, um, you can now see a map of Australia. We'd love you to annotate the screen and drop a tick or a cross or draw a circle with wherever you are joining us from today. And that will give you a chance. Brisbane, Sydney, Canberra, I can see. Someone's out to sea. <laughs> Hopefully you're on a boat. Uh, we're also keeping an eye on the chat today. So if you have questions as we go and you'd like to question or comment, um, feel free to add something in the chat channel. If you are joining us via Facebook, you can comment in the Facebook uh, session as well. And Bruce and I, when we're not speaking, we'll keep an eye on those channels and um, let you know if we can answer you on the spot or you know if there are questions that we want to share with the group. So thank you. I can see we've got some people north of the Victorian border, some people south of the Victorian border and someone in Tasmania. I'm waiting to see some pop-ups from Perth but I know it's not the best time so we often get our Perth teachers watching our recordings afterwards. They're still in school. Okay moving on. Um, I am going to clear the annotations. Uh, today what we're talking about is understanding coding concepts and what we wanted to cover specifically was to unpack what's in the curriculum when we talk about key ideas in the implementation content descriptors. What we want to do, it's not a coding session in terms of syntax or you know particular, we'll give you a few hints as we go, but we're not focused on a particular coding language as such. What we want to do is talk about what the coding concepts mean and how they build up from year three right through until year eight, um, why that sequence of build up makes sense and see some examples of code that show those concepts in action. So we're going to make a project today. Bruce and I are going to do a bit of coding on the spot. So wish us luck. Um, we're going to take an example of a student working on a project that covers their journey to school. Um, so we thought this was a nice project because all the way from kindergarten, students can have good discussions with you about how they get to school and various levels of detail. So we're going to have a go at turning that into a coding project. 
just get my annotation tools put away. Let me uh, close that. Okay. So as I said, we're going from hello world to functions and we'll be moving fairly swiftly. Just before we get into the live coding, we're really interested to know, and again, feel free to use the annotation functions or add something in the chat. Um, what languages you're currently using? Are you using block-based coding like Scratch or Blockly? Are you using Python, JavaScript? Um, and let us know, and that will be useful information for us. Good news is in our coding today, we're going to be looking at Blockly, Scratch, and Python. And one of the things we really want you to take away from it is that once these concepts are making sense, it actually, in a way, the language doesn't matter too much. The underlying concepts are very similar across all of the languages. Great. That's a really nice spread there. That's good. Okay. So the first concept that we wanted to talk about, and this is where our coding journey begins. Um, a lot of you will have seen Hello World as a first line of code that people write. The first coding concept is sequence. So when we talk about sequence, we talk about computers following instructions in order. Uh, and the most simple uh, sequence would be top down, no decisions, no changes. Every time you run the project, the code is exactly the same. So we've put some snippets there of different languages. Um, the one on the left is Blockly. Now this is block-based coding, which is recommended for primary school students. The one on the right is Scratch. And straight away, you can see just how similar they are. So Blockly uses the word print to output something onto the monitor. Scratch uses say, and the sprite will do something. Um, at the bottom there, we have some Python. Again, it uses the keyword print. So if I switch across here, here we have uh, Coding for a journey to school set up as a sequential project. So we're going to simply say my journey to school. I'll let you read along. I don't need to read that out. Uh, if you're joining us and you're not familiar with the interface that you see here, this is Grok Learning. Uh, this is what hosts all of our coding challenges. The way it works is that you can access coding blocks here from the menu in the, in the center of your screen. Uh, you can pull them out, create projects. This is Blockly. The really nice thing about it is that it maps one-to-one -one with Python. So in the bottom half of my screen, where it says code, you can see that we have the same commands, but in the Python programming language with print. And I can run the code from my browser by clicking on run. In the output, you can see very simply what this project does, my journey to school, and it just simply prints those commands on screen. So every time I run the project, exactly the same thing will happen. I'm not able to influence the project as the user of it at all. It's the same every time. If we look at a project in Scratch, um, all of these sprites here, don't be concerned. You can see the code looks very similar. Again, it's a sequence of instructions. When I click on my first sprite, she runs through each command one by one. So this is what we call sequential coding. It's our simplest form. If I pop back and have a look at the key content descriptors from the Australian curriculum, what we're doing when we write sequential code is that we're implementing a simple digital solution as a visual program. It's as simple as that. Um, and I've copied three content descriptors into the slide deck today, year three, four, year five, six, and year seven, eight. So with the Python code you saw before, Python is what we call a general purpose programming language. It's typed in and it's what's recommended for high school students. So again, here you can see that we're implementing a program. Um, I've highlighted the parts of the content descriptor I think would be covered by that. Uh, obviously, we haven't covered the whole content descriptor yet, um, but you can see that all of the bands that we're talking about today have the idea of implementing solutions. Uh, primary is visual programming, secondary is general purpose. And we've seen a very simple example so far of what sequential instructions look like. 
Now that's well and good. However, we would like to do something a bit more with our coding. So let's move on to the next step. And this is where you go next with students. It's what we call branching in the curriculum. And this is where we start to make decisions so that our code may not look the same every time we run it. Uh, with primary and secondary, the key word here is if. So if something is true, do something. And in primary, that's really for year three and four, if and then is as far as you would need to go. As we get a little bit more sophisticated, we might say if something is true, do it else. So in this way, whether it's true or false, we will do something. We'll follow one of the two branches. And then we can get more complicated again by using ELIF and Python. So we get more than one option that we can follow. Let's look at this in coding. So if I come back into my coding window, we have the statement here that I check the weather. Let's add a decision in here. So I'll bring up my Blockly block. Now, if statements have two really important parts, this yellow block here is a, what we call uh, a statement we're going to evaluate as being true or false. It's a Boolean statement. Now, for the proficient coders amongst you, kind of just take a pause for a moment here because what I'm about to do doesn't quite make sense, but it's just to show you an idea. So I'm going to say if the weather equals rain, then I would like my computer to say, take an umbrella. So we have a decision, does the weather equal rain? We have an action, print. And now this code structure incorporates branching. We're making a decision. When I run the code, you'll see it's jumped straight ahead and it hasn't actually told me to take an umbrella. That's because this bit here called weather and rain, our computer's reading those both as strings. So it's comparing each letter in the phrase. Is a W the same as an R? Is an E the same as an A? And so forth. And obviously weather and rain are not the same. We're going to fix that up in the next bit of coding, but this is just to show you the basic structure of an if statement and what would happen. Again, you can see the code here. Uh, the key thing when you're working with high school students, I said this was not a session about syntax, but I will point things out as we go. Um, indentation is a really important concept when you're teaching Python. So you'll see that the print statement, which will only run if the weather is rainy, is indented. It's two spaces in or one tab, depending on who you want to talk to. Um, Bruce probably has a strong opinion on that. In from the margin. And that is to tell you as the user that code only runs if the if statement's true. And the other thing that stands out here is when we compare two values in an if statement, we're using a double equals sign in Python. So if you're, stu if you're starting out teaching Python and you write this with a single equals or your students do and they're confused as to why it doesn't run, that's a simple thing that I guarantee everyone's gonna get wrong while they're learning. Okay. Just before Nicola jumps back in to introduce the next concept, I think what I'd like to point out here is that the whole point of adding this decision and the point of the program that we have is because we want the behavior of the program to differ on the basis of this condition, this whether it's raining or not. So this attempt from a student is pretty typical of what we would see the first time. Uh, since the rain is the thing that we're checking for, and that's the weather, we create this, this, this statement. But as you can see, every single time Nicola runs this file, uh, this program, it's gonna generate the same output. And we will never ever see that take an umbrella block occur because the word weather and the word rain will never, no matter how many times we click this run button, will ever be the same. Thank you. Okay, so we are now going to talk about the next key concept in coding, uh, which is the concept of input. Uh, input, when we're coding, talks about me, the user, giving something to the computer so that it can do something with it. Now, I'm using my keyboard today because I'm using this Blockly interface. Uh, but inputs come in many forms. They might be action on your phone, so shaking your phone, tapping on a screen. Uh, they could be some hardware. So your Apple Watch has a bunch of sensors in there. It might be telling you the temperature. 
it might be getting an input as to movement. Uh, you might there are so many examples of inputs. You might have connected your program up to an API coming out of, for example, Google Maps. So you're getting information about location. All sorts of inputs are possible here. We just want to use the keyboard. So I'm going to throw away that word weather and I'm going to take an input. I'm going to ask my user what the weather's doing. Um, just from a usability point of view, I'm going to ask them to say rain or sun because my code's not clever enough to, yet to know what to do if I put in frequent showers. So I'll just say, let's say rain or sun. Now let's run the code. Now you can see here that my code's waiting for me. So it says, what's the weather doing, rain or sun? And if I type in rain, it tells me to take an umbrella. So now my project can adapt to the inputs it's receiving. If I say, son, I walked to school, I didn't need my umbrella. So that's a really simple example of taking an input, adapting the program, depending on what the answer is, using some branching and having a different output. I'll show you what that looks like in Scratch. It's very similar. So I think, here we go, I pack everything I need, I check the weather. Now in Scratch, um, if we look here, it's uh, waiting here for an input from me. If I enter rain, I'm asked to remember my umbrella. Let's look at the code for that one. Just make it a little bit bigger. So quite similar to Blockly, um, in Scratch there's a block called ask. It's a very, very useful block for students, particularly if you want to make sure you're using Scratch in a very purposeful way to meet curriculum outcomes. Ask is a great block. It lets you provide a keyboard input and it saves it automatically here in this little block called Answer. So we find that across in the Sensing menu. And depending on my answer, I'll get a different output. Okay, so heading back to the slides. What we can see after that is, let me pop over here. We've talked about taking an input. If we head back to the curriculum now, you can see year three and four coding concepts implement digital solutions as visual programs with algorithms involving branching and user input. We've just done that in one project. Now a very simple project admittedly, but those key concepts that you see in the content descriptor um, can be explained and used as simply as we've just shown you. And that's where we would like to see your three and four students get to, is having a confident understanding of branching, uh, using inputs and working on visual programs. You can see for year five and six, uh, iteration is still to come and there's a bit more for year seven and eight. But you can also see that that idea of branching sits across all of the band levels. Um, I've skipped over it a little bit, but the branching that you do would get more sophisticated as students get older. So you would move beyond that simple idea of just if then, and you would start to create different conditions and you might nest them as well. So you would have different tiers of if statements. So the next thing we'll touch on briefly, which you won't see mentioned in the curriculum, but is a very important part of programming, is the use of variables. If we head back in, variables are simply a way of saving data in the program and a way that you can save and change data in a program. Now, primary students can struggle with this as a concept. Um, it requires a bit of abstract thinking to get there. I think the way I've had the most success personally teaching it is any kid that's into gaming has a pretty good understanding of points. So they know if you can get them to imagine what the code might look like, that there will be a variable called score. Uh, their actions will change that variable, but there'll always be a label somewhere in the code called score that's saving a number, which is changed and used. So if we head back into Grok, we've asked the question, we haven't saved it anywhere yet. So if we came back down and thought, at the end of the day, we've all left umbrellas behind, right? So if we wanted our program to give us a reminder at the end of the day and say, 
don't forget your umbrella. And we want that to happen only if there's rain. The way I've set my code up so far, I would have to ask the user again at the end here. What's the weather doing? And we shouldn't have to do that in coding. We should be able to get through things yeah, as unrepetitively as possible. So this is the point where you introduce the variables for students. And we uh, have a block here that says set the variable. So I have one I've made earlier called weather. If you're starting from scratch, you can create and type a variable name in. And what we're gonna do is save our answer here. So in our code, we're going to remember what the answer was when the user types in, whether it's rainy or sunny. And then we can use this block called weather repetitively. So I'm going to put that now in two places. So if the weather's rainy, take an umbrella. And if it's rainy, it will tell me not to forget. Let's run that and see what happens. Okay, so I got my taken umbrella and I got don't forget my umbrella as both of my messages. If I run it again and it's sunny, neither of those messages appear. So that's an example when a variable will help you write better code. It's easier for me as the user. I didn't have to answer my answer, sorry, enter my answer twice. It's remembered my state of what the weather is doing today. Again, if we have a quick look at Scratch, uh, we have these orange blocks here that will save the answer in the variable. Scratch in the background does save the answer to questions. So if you are only using something once, you can just use this teal colored answer block. But if you're going to come back to it repetitively, it's great to use a variable. Okay, I'm moving swiftly. I know we've got some great stuff we're getting to. So I'm going to jump in and talk about the next big idea in the curriculum, which is iteration, doing things more than once. Um, and we're going to use loops. I'll go through the first type of loop and Bruce is going to jump in and show you the second kind. Uh, there are two loops that we use and the easiest way to remember them is that a for loop is a loop you use when you know how often something will happen. So if I am um, handing out exercise books in the classroom and I have 20 students, I could write a loop that says 20 times hand out the exercise book. That's a for loop. A while loop is when you don't know how many times something needs to happen. Um, and the example I usually use is an air conditioner or a heater with a thermostat. So you might set the temperature to 18 and it will say until the temperature gets to 18, keep heating. So there's no finite number of um, heating cycles happening. It's just going to keep heating until it's at the right temperature. Those are the two. So in my project now, the way I'm going to use a loop is I'm going to start getting directions to get to school. So I'm going to make a new variable. Oops, sorry. which is called direction. And just like I've done before, you can duplicate and drop, which is handy. Once I've figured out the weather, I'm going to ask which direction I want to go. Now on its own, If I say I want to go forward, I, I can ask which way I want to go once. Now that's a bit impractical. If we're navigating our way to school, it's unlikely it's a dead straight line from the front door. So what I'm going to do is use a loop, which here says repeat 10 times. I'll make it five times. And I'm going to put my direction in there and I'm going to, let me, use my variable. This is a different way you can use variables. 
we can join them in with other bits of text. Okay. Let's just have a look at what I've done there. I've moved a few blocks around. What my code will do when I run it now, instead of just asking me once how I want to get to school, it's going to keep asking me a set number of times. So let's run that and have a look. Let's say it's sunny. Which way do I go? I'll go forward. And then it asks me again. I'll go left. I'll go right. Okay, so you can see there, because I'd included a loop, everything inside that loop, the set direction and the print has happened five times. Let's have a look at the Python code. And similar to an if statement, you'll see there's some indentation going on here. Um, this is one of the simplest forms of loops. We can do all sorts of tricky things in Python and Blockly. We can count up by odd numbers, even numbers. We can leave gaps. We can count backwards. But here we've said for count in range five. So from one to five, ask me where to go. Save that and tell me. No surprises. When we have a look at Scratch, let me jump to that. Scratch is starting to get very similar to Blockly here. Again, we have a repeat block. We ask a question, save it to a variable, and say go direction. So the concept translates really well between the three programming languages. We're doing the same thing in each place. The syntax is actually pretty similar. Um, and we're now moving into the year five and six level using loops. That's a for loop, as I mentioned, when we know exactly how many times we do something. The next concept we're going to look at is while loops. So when we don't know how many times to repeat something. And for that, I'm going to hand across to Bruce and let him take over the screen and continue with the coding. Okay, so as I do that, I want to make sure I grab the correct window here. I don't want you all to see what's coming up and get the answers in advance. Um, I think it's this one. Let's see if I've got that correct. I bet this is wrong. Unfortunately, the window is way too small on my screen. Um, have I? I'm seeing your screen now, Bruce. Which one? Is it, is it the one? Can you see my cursor? Yep. And I've got the code that we just made, the for loop. Excellent. So I did it the right way around. That is great news. So <laughs> one of the things that is going to come up regularly when you're trying to talk a little bit about iteration with students is this problem where you don't know how many times you want to repeat an instruction. And I want you to think about that in the context of, say, Google Maps doing a navigation path for you in this particular context. So at the moment, our input is coming from the user. They're typing in a direction. You can think of this input as potentially coming from uh, some kind of algorithm that a mapping piece of software has used to feed in the directions you go. And then the output, rather than being a print, might be a little sort of notification on your Apple Watch or something about what the direct next direction you go is going to be. So what we're going to do instead is actually continue to receive directions um, until there are no more directions left. And so to do that, we're going to replace this section here, this for loop, with a while loop. And the while loop is this one here. So what we want to do is repeat until there are no more directions. If we get one of these logic blocks out, um, then we can check our direction that Nicola has created for us earlier. And we can keep checking until the direction is empty. Now, the problem, of course, right now is that there's no point prior to this block where we actually ask for a direction. So I'm going to grab our set direction block here and drop it in there. And now we're actually able to set the direction, see whether or not it's um, blank, and so we're going to repeat while it's not blank. As soon as it's blank, we're going to stop. And we want to print the direction out. 
And then because this is going to repeat over and over and over again, let's see what happens when we run this code as written. So we'll run, I'll open the output terminal, I'll type in sun, and then I'll say left. And our program now goes left forever. And if I leave this running, eventually Grok will terminate it. But if you do this on a, pro, on a computer where you don't have this sort of uh, interface, which is running everything in the little sandbox for you, students will actually have to uh, interrupt the code with some sort of break uh, or, or kill the program or do something to be able to reset and then troubleshoot this. The reason that's happening is because we never change direction after this point, and this block repeats over and over and over and over and over and over again, direction is always going to be left. And so this never becomes true and we stay in the loop forever. To fix it, we simply ask the user to specify the direction again after that point. So we run it again. And this time, if I say left, it'll tell me to go left. If I say right, it'll go right. Forward will work as well. But as soon as I press enter, that will terminate the loop since it will meet the condition that we specified to exit the loop. So repeat while the direction isn't blank. As soon as the direction is blank, we then exit the loop and the program continues. So this concept is a really important one. Uh, this is only one example of how you use it, but the big thing to emphasize when students are using while loops is to remember that it's possible to get stuck in this loop forever. And when you do get stuck in a loop like that, um, you're going to end up in a world of hurt if you don't remember to actually change the value of the data as you're stepping through. So if we have a look at what that looks like in Python, you'll see that just like the for loop, we have the indentation that occurs inside the while loop there. Um, the not equals in Python is actually represented with a bang equals or an exclamation mark equals. Um, and that's simply because historically, as far as input is concerned, there are only so many ways that you can write not, um, and there's no key on the keyboard for equals with a slash through it, which is what we're familiar with from mathematics. So I guess one of the things that we wanna emphasize is that whilst the code here if the blocks may look like there was a substantial difference in terms of how it changed and operated. If we translate that through to Python, you'll see that the, there is actually a pretty close correlation as Nicola referred to earlier on. Uh, now this Blockly implementation in Grok is, a, is an implementation that has been written by the, the authors and, and the developers at Grok Learning. Um, what's very interesting for, for people who are a little bit more familiar with this stuff is that down the track, um, the actual language that runs underneath Blockly can be a number of things. It can be Python, it can be JavaScript, it can be almost anything. But for now, and the reason we, we show you Python code is Python's quite an accessible language for students to use, because as you can see, the parallels between the two are actually really quite simpler, similar. Now, I also have a um, Scratch example that I'll show you. So I'll jump in there now. And if we go into, I think it's this one. Yep, you can see we have exactly the same thing going on here too with our set direction. So repeat until direction, join, re-ask the question, and we could do this over and over and over again. So if we run this sprite, we'll ask the question to check the weather, and we'll see exactly the same behavior here. I'll only go one instruction this time. And when I press enter, it'll exit. So let's quickly talk about what that means in terms of the curriculum. We've now got all of years three to six covered and we've looked at multiple versions of branching. The next thing that we want to start exploring is how we can start taking advantage of the fact that we have these sort of iterative tools like loops to store and process lots of data at once. And one of the ways we do that is we start investigating things called data structures. And specifically, we're going to look at lists. Lists are the simplest of data structures. Um, you may also have heard them referred to as arrays in some languages. 
basically they go far beyond variables. They allow us to store multiple values in one place or one reference in the computer. And once they're stored in that location and they're stored as a collection, we can do a number of different things with them. We can change them, we can add to them, we can remove them, um, we can sort them. There are lots of different manipulations that you can do on lists, but we're gonna start with something pretty straightforward. Um, what we're going to do is simplify that activity that we did earlier. Uh, and we're going to store all of the information that we've been um, that, about our trip to school in one place and then use that to actually um, set out the directions that we're going to go. So we don't have to ask the user constantly for that information. So lists in Blockly um, look like this. There are a number of different representations of lists. They actually, um, in Scratch, we'll have a look at what they are, but they sit in the variables section as well. They're very similar to variables in terms of how they operate. Like I said, they store data, but this time they're storing multiple things. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of asking directions, which is what we're doing here, I'm going to create a different variable and I'm going to call this direction list. And I'm going to instead specify four directions that we need to follow to get to school. So to get to school, we're going to go left, left, right, and forward. And then because we've got this list, which has four items in it, what we can actually do is simplify this loop. And instead of using a repeat, we can actually use this for loop, which is for each item in direction list. Go direction. So this allows us to, if we run the code, oops. Oh, oops, there's a mistake. So I had left this as direction and because we replaced the variable with direction list, direction no longer existed. And so I got an error in my output. And I think one of the things that's really important to emphasize with students when you're doing this type of thing is making mistakes is a normal thing that occurs in programming. You can make a mistake and it's not a disaster, right? It's software. You can just run it again. Now, clearly, if this was actually a program that people were relying on for some reason, um, that would be a problem. But when you're testing and developing things for the first time, making mistakes is a really natural part of development. Um, you can guarantee that no matter how long someone has been writing code for, they're going to make mistakes like that all the time. So what this particular block does, it's a slightly different for loop to the one that Nicola used before, because the previous one said um, repeat five times. This one is actually going to look at direction list, and we're going to say if we refer to each of the items one at a time and we call it J, then we want to repeat the same thing with each of those items. And in this case, we're just gonna act simply print, go, and then the item itself. So in this block, inside this for block, we're actually going to use J to refer to each of the items. Now, really what I probably should do is rename this and make it something more um, obvious as to what it is. So I might call it direction or de. And now I can see for each item de in direction list, it's a little bit more meaningful. There's some semantic explanation of what the data is there. Um, we can print go that direction. Let's try it again. And this time, hopefully, I've fixed the problem that I had in my code. So you can see I specify the weather. And then all of the direction stuff is automatically done based on the values we put in our list. If I add rain, it'll insert the umbrella um, reminders again. But every time we run this code, it's going to go left, left, right, forward. Now, this is fine and will work really, really well, assuming, of course, that the directions never change. And if they do change, 
you actually have to go in here and edit the code itself. You can see I have to change the code and run it. Um, and now it work. Now it will go right, left, right, forward. But this editing of the code is not really the most ideal situation. You really want to be able to update the list on the fly and make it easier for the user or for the input if it's coming from somewhere else. Like I said, if you consider um, how directions work in Google Maps or Apple Maps or other mapping software, uh, that's generated at the time you put your uh, home and destination into the application. You want to be able to generate that data at a specific point in time. So we're going to swap this out and do it a little bit differently. And we're going to build our list start from nothing. So instead of doing this, I'm going to throw that away. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create direction list as an empty list. So at the moment, it has nothing in it at all. And then what we want to do is we actually want to use, ask the user to start to build up the direction list. And this is actually going to look very, very similar to the way that we asked them previously to enter data. So we'll repeat while what they enter is not blank. We will, of course, need to set their direction to ask block, which is an input. I'm just going to simplify the question now to which direction. Uh, and then we are going to want to add. Oh, where is the... We seem to have lost the list operation here, Nicola, to append to the list. Um, let me see if it's in one of the other problems. I was going to say, Bruce, it's definitely in one of the later examples. All right, let's jump in then to this one here. There it is. Yep, there it is. So this is this is code we prepared earlier. But um, as you can see, uh, what we've done is we've created the empty list. We ask the user to specify their direction. And then every time we repeat the instruction, this time we don't print it back like we were doing last time but we add it to the direction list that they've created. So this is exactly the same code as I had before. Um, I'm going to rename this again to make it a little bit more semantically meaningful. And so now when we run the code, it asks us which way we want to go. But notice we're not actually getting output each time we enter a direction. Instead, it's just doing something with it. It turns out it's actually saving it. And because it's using this append operation, it's adding the list to the end, uh, the new value to the end of the list. So I'm just going to say we go left, right, and that's all. When I press enter, direction list now has both of those in the list in that order, left and then right. And so it prints them out and we arrive at school. And this time when I run the program, if say I'm at my friend's house and instead of going left and right, I need to go right, forward and right, I can enter that information in that order and it still gets me there. So you can see that the program is now becoming very flexible. It can deal with changes in weather, it can be deal with changes in location. And whilst at the moment, the actual entry of the data is really manual and simplified, which is what you need to do when you're originally introducing students to these concepts, you can think of how external applications and software can actually feed this data into your app and that way, you wouldn't actually need any of this manual entry um, from outside of it. So a thermometer or you know, a weather app could actually feed in whether or not it's raining or sunny where you are. The directions could come from a mapping application. Um, in this case, all of the information, every time you use this append function, um, the destination, so what you're storing in, is going to be here on the right-hand side in direction list. And the value you're storing is what's stored in this variable, direction. So we set direction to the direction you want to go. And when it's not empty, we append it to direction list, which is what we step through when we get to this point here. So in Python, this is what it looks like. Our lists use this close bracket, exactly the same symbol that we use in Blockly. 
And then you can see that appending something to a list is done just using this dot notation here. So when we say append item to list, when we do that in Python, we do list dot append item. Now Scratch uses a very similar approach to Blockly. And I might just dive in there now. Just swap over. We might jump into this one here. Uh, nope, that's the, this one is the one I want. Here we go. So in Scratch, if you go down to variables and check these boxes, you'll actually be able to see the contents of a list, just like you can see the contents of a variable. So there's our weather variable. There's our direction list just here. Okay, if I run this code, oops, I click on Abby nine. First, we check the weather. I'm gonna write rain this time. And you'll notice that the variable has changed here. Which way do we go? The list is currently empty. Let's type forward. You can see forward gets added to the list. Now we'll try right. Right gets added to the list. Right again, it gets added to the list. So you can see that the advantage of using something like Scratch um, or a, a debugger when you're working with text-based languages is you can actually see the contents as it gets changed. And that's really, really handy when you're dealing with a new concept for someone, um, whether it's a, a beginner, like a young, a young child, or even an adult that's learning programming for the first time. Having, being able to see what's going on really does make sure that you understand exactly how the program is storing that information before it uses it. So I'm gonna finish that now and you can see go forward go right go right and then we arrive and the program ends so we put our umbrella out to dry now one of the things that we introduce to students in year seven and eight is a concept called functions and people get a little bit concerned about this topic because it feels quite complicated but essentially, when you create a function, your goal is to take some of the code away from the bulk of the program and store it elsewhere so that you can use it at a different point in time. It's really important when you start to look at the complexity of software to find ways that you can simplify the complexity, just so that you can actually um, parse or process all of the information on the screen so that it's manageable for you to troubleshoot and debug and do all those kinds of things. So in this example here, what you'll see is you'll see we need to define functions and call them, and they provide us with a mechanism through which we can abstract code away so we can focus on specific elements of the task involved. Let's jump back to our code example. and have a look at how much code we've got going on in this example right now. So it's starting to get long and unwieldy. We've got to scroll up and down. If we want to make significant changes to the code, we're going to have to change things in potentially multiple places. Um, one of the first things that we could potentially do to simplify this is take out all of this stuff related to specifying the directions that we want to go in. So if we pretend that direction list already exists and we look at what's going on here, this is a much simpler program to understand. Okay. Um, we have the initial sort of, you know, I'm going to school, check the weather, um, do the umbrella and go in the directions. Um, it's far easier for you to actually follow. This stuff here is all kind of set up stuff. It's stuff that, you know, we want to be able to write once, know it works, and then potentially reuse multiple times. Functions are exactly the types of things that let us do this. So what we'll do is create this new function. And what we'll call this is we'll call it get directions. 
All right. And what we can do instead now is say, well, in here, let's run our function. Get directions. And what the program will do is it will insert this code into here when we get to that point. So you can think of this as kind of, if we were doing this as a flow chart, you'd have the arrows going down to here. You'd get there, the arrow would go up to here, it'd do that, and then when it finishes, it'd go back to here. Let's see what happens when we run this code. Turns out we have an error here, all right? Um, and that's because it says that the code is not defined. Notice how get directions is at the bottom of the program here, and we use get directions above it. This is because I haven't connected those together. Turns out I don't even need to connect them together. I just need to make sure that that one is higher than this one. So now I'll run it again. And here we go, it asks us left, forward, and so on. But now we have a problem. It's running the code, but because all of this is happening separately, it's not happening as part of the normal program, um, direction list exists here, but it doesn't exist over here. This is what we call a scope issue. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of that and get a little bit complicated, but if we want our data manipulation over here to end up back in our program, we actually need to use a different block. We actually need to use this version of call do something because we want the information in here to be saved and given back to the program. Functions have these special blocks called return blocks. These return statements allow a function to give data back to the main program. And what I'm going to do is say that when we get to this point in the function, we're going to take direction list and we're going to give it back to this program. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new variable here, which I'm going to call directions. And we're going to set directions to whatever comes back from this program. Then, because directions will have all of the data in it, we change this to directions. And now, when I run the code, we can enter the directions and because this time we're using the correct variables and the data is coming back from this little get directions function that we've written, it will allow us to use this directions variable in the same way that we were using the directions list before. And then the program will continue. So this is a much shorter program to understand. And we've taken this sort of you know, information about how to get directions out of the main program. So you can think if down the track we change the way we get directions, we might make this get directions by typing values in, but we might also have get directions from Google. We would just change this to get directions from Google and our program doesn't have to change in any other way because this information is coming from an external location from another bit of code that doesn't necessarily exist inside the main program itself. Now I'm going to jump to one more example of this where we've gone even further and simplified the code by taking one other st step. At the moment, you can think of this as having a couple of elements. There's the getting of the directions and there's the going on the journey. If you were to ask a student to describe the process of getting to school, that would give you an example that is a very high level abstraction of that process. They're not gonna say, you know, walk three meters down the road, turn right. They're gonna say, um, I check the weather, I pack, my, I pack everything that I need, and then I come to school. So 
This last version of the program does exactly that. You can think of this here as being, um, you know, the program's title or the program's purpose, my journey to school. The only information I need to know is what the weather is and what the directions are. And then I just want to go to school knowing about the weather and the directions that I need to go in. That's it. That's the highest level version of this program. And what we've done is we've created two functions here. We've got set directions and do journey. If we have a look at what set directions looks like, set directions is basically exactly the same code that I'd written in the previous example, right? There's our, you know, create the list, ask which ways to go, put it in. This could be getting information from Google just as easily as it is getting it from the user. I've then taken this bit where we actually step through the journey and we've actually fed the information in about the weather and the directions. And we're asking all of the questions here and storing it in a variable or a list. So we've got the variable based on the user's input and we've got the list based on the data from our set directions function. And all we need to do is specify in here that if we want the weather, we get the weather from where we fed it in. If we want the directions, we get the directions from where we've been provided them. And these steps are exactly the same steps as the ones that we've been using in the previous program, just extracted and abstracted away from our high level view. So this small snippet of code is easy to get your head around. That small snippet of code is easy to get your head around. And this small snippet of code describes all of the behavior that we want to see in our program. And if we run this, we get exactly what you would expect. So these steps in the process that we've gone through are sort of demonstrating the many ways that we can build complexity into software and address the curriculum at the individual levels that are necessary to make sure that our students are seeing all of the curriculum. You should have the curriculum slide in front of your screen now. And you can see that the bit that in, gets introduced in seven and eight is this element of functions, okay? Functions in a general purpose programming language like Python. I didn't show you the Python code in the functions example, but I'll jump back to that in a minute so we can have a look at how Python does that. But you can see that we take the bridge branching, iteration and functions concepts and feed them into our discussion as to how general purpose programming languages work and why it's important that these functions actually exist. So just jumping back to that code very, very briefly. So you can have a look at how functions are dealt with in Python. You can see we have these def statements, which are the definitions of the functions. And when we call the functions, we simply state the function itself and feed in any arguments or values that we've received into the function inside those brackets. We have a scratch version of the project as well, which I know Nicola will be sending me out with all of the other information in our post webinar email and communications. Um, Nicola, I might throw back to you to finish us off for the for this webinar. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so thanks everybody. Um, we had an ambitious plan to try and explain all of the coding in the curriculum from years three to eight in an hour. And I think we've put it in in one minute over. I hope it's not been overwhelming for people. Um, really, we set out to show that progression and see how the concepts build upon one another across the different year groups. And no matter what year group you are, it's interesting to see what the year groups either side of you would be working on. So um, as Bruce mentioned, we are going to share the slides, the links to the Scratch project. And we also have a document that will get out to you in the next few days, which shows all of the code snippets so you can see um, Python, Scratch, Blockly and the code output side by side across all of those different parts of the project we've talked about. Now I'm very conscious of the time and I really appreciate everyone staying right through to the end. I'm happy to stay and answer any questions in the chat or switch your microphones on if you have questions but of course obviously if you need to go please do um, and we'll also have a recording of this available which we will put up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So with that, I'll open up for questions um, and thank you all for coming along today.
Okay. 